Thank you very much. Uh, you put a, a lot of ideas out there. I know. And <laughs> let's, let's, let's kind of start in the beginning. You were talking about the 1980s and the history of broker deposits and the savings and loan crisis back in the good old days when bankers went to jail who broke the rules. When I thought, when I read through the FDIC's... She'll go to jail for fraud. They, well, uh, anyways. Go to our IG. They actually send people, they, they arrest people and take them to jail. I, I, uh, I, I remembered watching that after Enron, uh, which was a different kind of fraud. But the, 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 you guys, when you were going through the last financial crisis uh, and did a big history on that, the FDIC kind of wrote, quote, the history shows that failures and downgrades were highly correlated with reliance on brokered deposits and other wholesale, wholesale funding sources, end quote. So I kind of want to ask like a threshold question, right? You have this topic. It was certainly mega toxic in the SNL crisis. It's, according to the FDIC's work, it had an interaction and a, and a high correlation with the last crisis. Why choose to engage, right? You don't have a legislative mandate. What was the rationale and choice behind going down this road? Because apparently I didn't get the, the main lesson of being in Washington, D.C., which is that status quo is always better than uh, rocking the boat when the boat is, you know, has holes in it. Um, uh, all joking aside, it's because, frankly, we looked at um, both the history of how we have interpreted broker deposits. We have looked at the technological changes in the industry. We actually have looked uh, ad nauseum through the legislative history of uh, the changes uh, made to the FDI Act in response to the crisis and the broker deposits. And we tried to understand exactly what was congressional intent. And as former congressional staffers, I always like to be uh, closer to congressional intent uh, rather than further away because that can get us to all kinds of trouble. Frankly, industry has changed. Everything has changed about how deposits are taken. You know, how many of you would have imagined 15 years ago taking a picture of, your, of a check and depositing it? 15 years ago. And we're talking about a statute that was put in place 30 years ago. And uh, I, I, uh, I actually had to teach my daughter the other day what it looks like to sign the back of a check and it says deposit only. <laughs> and apparently that's a lost art on, on, uh, on, on kids these days. So the, uh, the industry has changed the way banks uh, and, and uh, non-banks, frankly, are, are uh, dealing with the deposits uh, has changed. And the statute has not kept to date. So I, I figured... It's better to open it up for comment and allow all of you an opportunity to comment uh, that the affected stakeholders will, I'm sure, comment uh, and give us feedback on what should be changed and how it should be changed. Well, I mean, you make, you make a very fair point. A lot has changed in the financial world. Uh, in point of fact, as somebody who was involved in writing the law that allowed you to take that picture, you know, that, that would have been illegal to do without Congress changing the law. And it was only changed not because of a desire to increase with technology. It was changed because of 9-11, and the planes that used to fly the paper around were grounded for a week, and people got freaked out that that could regularly occur. So this kind of, uh, back then the Federal Reserve was very forward-looking on the payment system, and put out an idea, and Congress acted, but it was, it was a, more of a security and stability perspective. I, I, I commend you for thinking I about... I actually don't want to play Trivial Pursuit with Aaron Klein either. <laughs> well, I, I, I would love to play Star Trek Trivia with, with Governor Quarles. Um, <laughs> But, but the, 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 look, new financial technology is radically changing, right? I mean, we can, you know, I've been in presentations with, with fintechs, and we'll, we'll hear from one in the room in the panel, where in the end I thought I've opened a bank account and only then later found out that I actually opened a broker-dealer account that's going to sweep my money into a bank account, and I'm going to have all the appearance of running a bank account, but I think I'm actually having a broker deposit. And so we did, uh, uh, anecdotally, uh, we did the same thing, you know, a couple of my advisors and I, as we were looking through this, uh, we started looking at our accounts. Literally started looking through our different accounts, realizing that some were brokered, and we, we didn't know. Literally reading the fine print to understand this is a brokered account. And, do you th and, and, and is your point then that the risk that poses to the diff or the way consumers behave on those type of accounts have nothing in common with the six-month CDs that are chasing the highest interest rate? Yes. In the newspaper? The, 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 whole, the bottom line here is that we're not trying to, you know, shake up the system for the sake of shaking up the system. Uh, I would have probably picked a, a less difficult topic to do that on. The, the bottom line here is that we have a system that's, that's not clear 
as to what's brokered, what's not, is based on our interpretive opinions, which are also not clear to everybody. So not everybody's playing by the same rules in terms of uh, you know what's, what's brokered and not. And it's more so driven by the entity than the type of a deposit right now as, as we look at uh, to determine what's brokered and what's what do, not. What do you mean by the entity? We, w we would give advisory opinions that something is brokered and for entity A that may be reported as brokered, for entity B that same activity may not be reported so, as brokered. So there's a deep inconsistency across America's 5,700 depository institutions. I won't even talk about credit unions. Let's not. Yes. <laughs> um, okay. So um, uh, let's assume that, that your idea is adopted by the FDIC board tomorrow and, and you know, the first uh, lesson of working on the Hill is count the votes. Yes. And, and if you grow up um, on the wrong side of Iron Curtain, you don't take anything for granted. So I'm hoping we have enough votes, but we'll see tomorrow. But we'll see. We'll, we'll, we'll see. So... so then let's, let's play this little game that uh, kind of 10 years from now, right, we all get to come back and take a victory lap on this change. What do you think or hope the best impacts will be on, from this change that we'll have seen in society in 10 years? And, and bonus points, if that can impact a real person and not this kind of backroom consistency of the, of the back office of banking, which itself is a valuable perspective. So what we're hoping to accomplish is basically to encourage innovation in this space and, and, and while we're doing that to provide clarity uh, on how, how you can do the, the business of deposit taking and what is truly brokered, what is not, without you actually having to go to the Orinoco tri uh, tribes and, and figure out what exactly you know, they're saying. Um, the bottom line here is that uh, we're stifling innovation. If you have to send me a request to explain if something is going to be brokered or not, is you're entertaining different business models that have not been entertained before. Uh, and we take, say, six months to a year to respond to you. You know where that product is going? To Hong Kong and London. Okay, and there was just an article about two, three weeks ago that London is overpassing Silicon Valley uh, as the uh, startup and, and innovation hub. And so the question is, how do you want our system to function? Do you want it to function based on a 30-year-old law that has uh, been um, uh, surpassed by the technological changes? That are, frankly, the law is stifling innovation in this case. And uh, waiting for us to give you that interpretation is, is truly could kill your business model. And if that business model works to the benefit of the consumers, then we need to be more responsive. In the end, you know, America is, is a place where people come because... I came here because it was, you know, one of the best places in the world for innovation and for the opportunity to, to do things that nobody else is doing. And if our regulatory framework is not adjusted to that and actually fosters innovation and promotes innovation, it's not going to be a place where things develop. Yeah, it's no, going to be someplace else. The, the difference between permission and forgiveness is somewhat important, right? If you think about ride servicing, right? If, if Uber and Lyft had gone to every single county and ask the taxi cab board for permission, I can at least tell you in my county of Montgomery County, Maryland, where the taxi cabs are controlled 90% by a guy named Barwood who also sits on the Citizens Advisory Board as chair of the Taxi Cab Commission, I can tell you where that would have ended up, which was incredibly expensive and poor service that was deeply disrupted. On the other hand, we have a financial services sector that has a very different role than local transportation, that has a lot more government regulation. So let's play the time traveler game in a different way. We are going to come back from the future and something went wrong. And we'll say that it was your successors, watch and error, who did something, something bad happened in this rule under their watch. Of course. Of course. <laughs> what do you think it would have been? Well, if we come back from a time travel, I would insist that you write me a comment letter when you're in that point further in time and then make sure to deliver it within our comment period now. Uh, telling me what really I need to focus on. Um, I, I, as I, I, I wish I could be Dr. Ma I wish I could have been Dr. Manhattan for those of you watching the latest show. <laughs> That's your comment letter. Thank you then. Um, here's the bottom line. Um, we have, as we developed um, this comprehensive overhaul, this is, this is not, you know, we had a choice of do we just want to tinker on the edges and, you know, not not shake the boat, 
you know, why would you? Um, or do we want to actually create a system that's going to be feasible, a regulatory system and framework for deposits uh, and broker deposits that's going to be feasible and open to innovation as we look forward? Basically, we could have done, you know, look back five to 10 years and address those issues, or you could look forward 10 to 20 years and try to address and create a framework that's going to be open and a platform for those developments to, to, to be uh, sustainable in, in that platform. Uh, we tried to analyze, you know, where some of the of the shortcomings of the proposal, and um, frankly, where, where you know we could uh, we as the as the agency uh, could foresee trouble. And as we look at that, frankly, um, I will rely on, on on you to be even more creative than we were, you know, in in, in the in the setup of this of this framework. But but uh, the bottom line is that we, we have looked at um, the same issues that we looked always, you know, a bank that is close to being undercapitalized, just trying to beef up, you know, their, their um, balance sheet um, with, you know, deposits of all kinds and, and loans, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's kind of a same formula that we need to be cognizant about, uh, which is why we frankly do have some recommendations for Congress uh, if they're willing to take this on and, and, and create legislation that will address some of these issues. In the end, we have to work, uh, and this has been paramount uh, for me as the chairman of the FDIC, we have to work within the constraints that Congress gave us. And uh, Congress, as you know, as you've drafted legislation in the past, um, you give regulators some discretion in, in, in these statutes, right? And it's up to the regulators to exercise that uh, discretion judiciously. So as we look at this rule, you know, we figured out what are, what are the four walls of where Congress wanted us to be. We, you know, spent a lot of time analyzing that congressional intent and the debate on the, on the floor of Congress uh, as to why this is necessary. We looked at the historical data and, and tried to come up with a framework that's uh, innovative on its own, uh, but frankly that lacks some congressional guidance to make it perfect. And to the extent that Congress is willing to give us um, additional changes, uh, you know, even if, it's, even if it's going to make our job at the FDIC more difficult, but better for the system overall, we're, we're more than willing to work with them to do so. In the meantime, we'll also take a look at uh, pricing uh, deposits accordingly, depending on what category they fall, fall in, and that's something that we have not undertaken in a while. Um, so pricing risk to the diff uh, in accordance to the risk that uh, these deposits present will be something that's on the table as well. So I'm going to turn to the audience in, in one second, but I have one final question before that, which uh, I commend you for putting out a proposal to Congress, and I know that's not something you've well, undertaken. Let's not, let's not go that far. No, no hashtags proposal to Congress, okay? This is, this is subtle recommendations on improvements to a 30-year-old law. In, in regulatory speak, it's bold and it's meaningful. And the, the one I want to kind of dig in a little bit is, is goal to, the, you said the goal is to prevent trouble banks from trying to grow out of trouble. This is kind of the uh, ultimate position of equity as you approach zero value versus the insurer's role, right? They can flip a coin. If I grow my way out of trouble, I still have something of value. If I fail, I, I failed anyway, so what does it matter if I run up your tab, essentially? Part of the problem in that is knowing when an institution is in trouble. And as the FDIC, you're in this unique situation where you're the insurer, but often not the primary regulator. And as I've looked through the history of lots of troubled and failing institutions, the primary regulator has more information than you do. And they often get to determine when the institution is or isn't in trouble and they have their own mixed incentives as to, as to whether or not to allow the institution to fail or not. The question I want to ask is, if they were to kind of go down more this goal route that you're suggesting, within the regulatory framework, what is the role and responsibility and how would the relationship between the FDIC and the primary regulator need to change? And more broadly, what would be the cultural ramifications of an institution, because if you're not going to allow them to grow out of trouble, then they need to fail. Yes, and in, in, in a free market economy, you know, some institutions fail, some succeed. Uh, hopefully, you know, fewer fail than than um, 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 than, than th those that succeed, and, and the failures are not as common as success. But that's how the market works, right? It, it, and that's normal. So the, the the idea here would be to, if Congress were willing to put a cap on how much they can grow, so that at least we're minimizing the risk to the deposit insurance fund. Your real question is really not about that. Your real question is, you know, how are you going to work with the, with the other regulators on making sure that you have enough information to step in when you need to step in? So we do, we do keep uh, uh, data on how banks are doing. Uh, we do have backup supervision. We actually 
have two separate uh, backup supervisions, uh, one through Dodd-Frank and one prior to that that Congress gave us. And, you know, we're just going to have to be willing to flex our muscle and say, no, we need to step in there sooner rather than later. And again, if you think this proposal is bold, that's, I'm willing to make that call as well. Uh, luckily for me, I, I have a very good working relationship with uh, the controller uh, of the currency and, and both with the chairman of the Federal Reserve and the vice chairman for supervision. I don't think that would be a problem uh, to go in and say, listen, we actually have serious concerns about this and we need to put a cap. Uh, and we need to exercise the you know, statutory cap. We can't put a cap right now. Uh, at, at, uh, it would take a whole lot more than, than uh, just small regulatory discretion to put that cap. But we could basically do that. And I, in my view, we should absolutely exercise that authority as the, both the receiver, receivership and the resolution authority, but also as the deposit protection authority. Right. I, I couldn't agree with you more about the need for, if you have 5,700 institutions and they survive year after year, that to me is not the mark of a healthy free economy. I was thrilled to see four financial institutions fail in the last six weeks. I know that's been a lot of work for you guys. No, it's, it's actually, I'm glad you mentioned that. Um, I wasn't thrilled to see them fail, but I wasn't concerned. And I looked at every one of those institutions and I said, is this idi idiosyncratic? Uh, idiosyncratic uh, failure, or is this something that's that's indicative of a broader issue? I don't want to be the chairman, you know, who was asleep at a switch. There were four banks, and they all failed for the same reason. And you know, what were you doing on on such and such date? And then there's a documentary with my face, kind of a staring at the camera, going, "Well, I was having a cappuccino." Uh, the, uh, so the, the, the bottom line is, you know, we looked at them, and, and after I analyzed each of those failures and talked to our staff, they were idiosyncratic. They, those, uh, they were not indicative of anything else. But I did have, a, frankly, I had a sense of, uh, a little bit sense of relief. We did not have a bank failure for 17 months, and that's not normal. And what I, in, in, a, in a good year, in a good year, when the economy is good and everything is going well, we have about five. Uh, our, our problem bank list is to low, at the lowest level at 51 banks. And so to uh, not have a failure was not normal. That's, not normal. Yeah. And Th people need to understand, not normal. Three right. years in American history, there weren't a bank failure, calendar year. Three years. 2005, 6, and 17, right? The first two of those years was not a mark of a good thing. And so it's, it's hopefully we're, we're, we're on a good track. And, and that's exactly why I had heightened scrutiny of those banks to make sure, are we missing something? Are we missing something? In the end, they all failed for individual reasons. Uh, they're specific to each bank. So on that note, who in the audience? Bert, I see you in the back, and I know that you have a comment letter, so I can't say I'm shocked. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair, for uh, being here today and uh, sharing your, your thoughts with us. Um, I want to come back to your comment about uh, growth, uh, which I have long considered to be uh, the, the really uh, high-risk uh, situation with banks. When they grow very rapidly, they increase the likelihood of at least getting into trouble. My question for you is, is this. Uh, to what extent have you, uh, in, in looking at this proposal and at risk-based pricing, decided to think that it's more appropriate to focus on the rate of growth uh, in, in a bank as versus how that growth is funded because there are various ways to fund growth other than with broker deposits. Um, so if you're going to provide clarity uh, to, to, to industry in general, right, if you're going to have a uniform approach of what is brokered and what is not, that's not driven by an individual institution but the, the type of a deposit, uh, you have to focus on um, what would enable us to minimize the risk to the diff. Right, and that's that's when the idea of well, it, restricting growth would be better than saying you can't do broker deposits because you could still do risky stuff, even uh, if you're not getting broker deposits, right? But are, are you thinking then of incorporating into the risk-sensitive deposit insurance premium some growth-related factors, such as a high, a faster-growing bank would pay a higher premium than a slower-growing bank? You know, Bert, if I told you now, you would never come and listen to my board meeting presentation, and you would not. So you'll have there. to stay tuned for part two and season two of this, yes. <laughs> All right, there, we got a cliffhanger. Um, Jackson. Hey, Chairman McWilliams, this is uh, Jackson Mueller from the Milken Institute. So Hi. great to have you here. Aaron, thank you very much and for Brookings for putting this on. Uh, quick question for you. Uh, just based on my list, and you, you talked about it earlier about you know when Congress will get engaged on this. Uh, I've got at least four bills here that I'm that I'm tracking, uh, covering deposit brokers. Well, there may All, be a fifth one too if they follow up on my uh, yeah exactly subtle recommendations. So, so I'm wondering as you are, are developing this proposal, how influential some of these uh, policies, some of this legislation was to what you put in your proposal. 
And uh, if any of these legislative bills that have been introduced in the House will actually counteract what you're looking to do. Thank yeah, you. So I have learned painfully not to comment on bills that are pending. Uh, and as a former congressional staffer, I also learned that you don't want regulators commenting on your bills. So I won't comment about the pending bills. Um, I, I wouldn't say they were influential. You know, we knew that Congress is looking at different things. Uh, and frankly, we have the information that Congress doesn't have uh, on, on the supervisory staff, uh, side. And uh, so we looked at, at throves of data. And we looked at, you know, give me, and I basically was very, uh, you know, speaking of, of blunt, was this, was this why the bank failed? Was that why the bank failed? So we went very specifically looking at uh, what caused some of the failures and, and were the broker deposits the cause of it? And if so, you know, what can be done, cannot be done. So what, we, what the plan we devised here was based on, on our institutional knowledge, uh, frankly, analysis of, of the failures, and then legally looking at different interpretations we have had over the years. Um, and I have to tell you, when I joined the FDIC, I knew there were a lot of questions about broker deposits. I just didn't truly understand uh, the, you know, the, the tributaries of Amazon that, that, that our framework looks like. Um, and and as, as I asked more questions, it became clear to me that there's no clarity to the outsiders as to what is and what is not brokered. And if you have to come to us and expect us to give you an opinion, and nobody else can abide by that opinion but just you, uh, you know, the, the, the playing field is frankly not leveled. And so what we're trying to do is both level the, that field, give clarity and certainty and transparency. Uh, you know, nothing, at least under my watch, nothing should be so opaque in how we regulate. The rules in, uh, of regulation should be very clear. And so if Congress, you know, takes a look at this, and again, notice we didn't, I didn't talk about any language as to how they would do any of this. These are just ideas and concepts that frankly, as we came to the bottom of the barrel here on what works and what doesn't and where we are restricted, we realized there's an opportunity for Congress to act if they could. Okay, uh, sir. Hi, um, I'm one of these hopeless people who got an MA in statistics back in 1973 and I interpret artificial intelligence as meaning the computers now have maybe a trillion times more power than the individual human brain to analyze things. So my question to you is, are there any technologists that are actually helping you with all of this data that you're analyzing, or, or how do we get technologies to help? And, you know, is blockchain an enemy or a friend potentially in <laughs> the kind of work you might be doing? I think there is a great opportunity for regulators to do more uh, with, with innovation and technology. And so we have set up at the FDIC Office of Innovation with a specific goal of looking at uh, these channels, the new channels of delivery, and how technology is facil uh, facilitating those channels of delivery. And I'm actually, I have been very reluctant to say that, you know, blockchain is a force for good or blockchain is a force for bad. Uh, distributed ledger technologies, et cetera, et cetera. I think there is an opportunity for us to take a look at what's going on and utilize the knowledge and, uh, from the outside and develop knowledge on the inside um, as to how we're looking at, you know, the future supervisors and the future examiners. There are going to be more data scientists and, you know, folks who are looking at, at a five-foot stack of loan documents, right? Uh, I think we'll be able to employ uh, machine learning and artificial in intelligence into analyzing the loan documents, right? And looking for, for idiosyncrasies and, and the patterns and, and repetitions and, and kind of a systemic and systematic issues as well. And so there's an opportunity for us to do a whole lot more. And I want to make sure that whatever we do now at the FDIC does not shortchange the opportunity to grow and, and be there with the technologies is developing or worse yet to stifle technology. So uh, we are working with folks on the outside looking at, uh, you know, how are they use, utilizing technology. I frankly, whenever somebody brings me a n novel business and, you know, say they're a fintech and they come and they said, oh, we decided to do this. I said, why? What market issue are you trying to solve? What is it that you are developing that folks with billions of dollars in, in, in ability to invest, did not invest. And, and then I, I go back to those folks, you know, usually they're, they're banks and they're some of the larger banks. And I was like, why didn't you develop that? You know, why, why did this happen outside of you? And so you want to understand the nexus as to why some of these things are developing outside of banks. Uh, and frankly, not just because I'm curious, you know, I am curious, right? But it's because frankly, we're, we're more things are developing outside of the banks that look like banking products and services than in the past. And a part of that is, you know, understanding why. And in my personal opinion, I think, uh, um, as I talk to uh, both, you know, regulated entities uh, that we regulate and also the non-banks uh, and fintechs, there was a need, and the banks didn't satisfy that need. And the question is why. 
And if it's because of regulatory concerns, then we should take a look at those regulations and see if it makes sense to change those regulations. And this is how we came with the broker deposits in addition to just general uncertainty and ad hoc approach we have had in the past. And the second thing I ask is, are we better off having these types of products and services inside of banks where we regulate them or outside of banks with the tech companies, which are more agile but regulated differently than banks, right? Uh, and you want to create a system that works. And I wish there was a formula. <laughs> I wish there were a formula. You know, I wish I could just put plug in things and tell you, well, if we do this, this happens. But quite often it's a seesaw. If we do this, you know, it kind of moves a little bit here and you want to make, make sure that you don't do more damage than good. And in the end, it's for the consumer. You want to make sure that there are adequate consumer protections in place on, on everything you're doing. You want to make sure that consumers have an opportunity to avail themselves of financial products. And then if those financial products are being offered outside of banks versus inside of banks, you want to make sure that, uh, that banks have an opportunity to do the same because I actually believe that the system and the customers, consumers benefit from competition. It's an incredibly important point that you make. You referenced the survey that talked about the unbanked. Well, the other part of that survey that strikes me is 20 to 25% of Americans are underbanked. That is, you know, what, what we're looking at, you know, one in, one in four to one in five Americans or three times as many people are underbanked as unbanked. And your definition of underbanked, which is now our definition, yeah, because yeah. When, you, when you set because the survey, you set the rules. Yes. It is a good definition. <laughs> and it basically says you have a bank account, but you also used a payday loan, a check casher, or a wire transmitter, which are three services that you would think a person with a bank account would never use. Yeah, and actually, you're, they're paying more than they would probably pay inside of the bank for the same type of services. Well, I, I, I've come to the, a different approach on check cashing mm -hmm. when you compare that to, to overdraft and when you look at the very, very slow number of days it takes to actually process a payment. That's a subject for, for a different day. Uh, but And a different agency. Uh, correct. Yeah, thank you. Okay. I, so I, so I, long I, as we're clear. I have, I have my 19-page comment letter into them from, from January. <laughs> so my, uh, the, the comment letter on this, to me, cannot be more than 19 pages then, all right? <laughs> all right. Uh, but the, the, the core point there is there's an inordinate number of people. Then I look at, speaking of the other agency, the, 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 the Fed did a good survey because other people get good data as well, on mobile banking. And they found that, and this was mind-blowing to me, Minorities use their smartphone to conduct banking more than whites. It's the only statistic I've ever seen in this financial services world that shows greater adoption and access for minorities than whites. Now, if I were teaching econometrics, there's a hidden variable. There's an omitted variable bias in which this is not a story of race. I can tell you the story of race and show you a statistic, and I'm playing bad statistics, which no economist has ever done in the history of economics. Uh, and in point of fact, it's age. When you actually adjust for age, the racial differences go away, but the minority population is inherently younger, and the actual variable that drives mobile adoption is age. But the other factor of this statistic that was fascinating is how, if I know how you use your bank mobily, I know how much money you have. If you move money between your accounts, if you use your smartphone to move money, you're rich. If you use your smartphone to check your balance, you're not. That's it. Divide America into two groups. People who occasionally hit zero on their bank account live paycheck to paycheck, and those who never do. And you can tell that with a high degree of precision just on how you use this technology. So I want to commend you for incorporating the future of financial technology, for thinking about not just that 7% of unbanked, but that much larger group of underbanked people for whom the system can work better, and appreciating that as younger people come online, this definition of what is a bank yep. and what isn't a bank becomes very blurry. And this broker deposit is kind of the hidden thing behind the thing behind the thing. Yes. Yeah. So no, it's, it's, I think you should write my preamble. <laughs> this was really good. Uh, and you can, you, can, you can cite the other agency study. I don't care. The, the, so here, here's the bottom line. Um, I, I, and, and thank you, by the way, for identifying it with such clarity. You know, we talk about broker deposits, we, we talk about deposit insurance fund and, and all of this in, in this, you know, kind of a amorphous regulatory language and it's technical and all of that. In the end, there is a consumer on the other end of that, right? And if our, so peel four layers and you come to broker deposits, in some cases, you know, it's three layers if you have an advisory opinion. If you don't have an advisory opinion, there's more layers, but, you know, it, it may be brokered or not, maybe. 
there is a consumer that either benefits or is shortchanged by our rules, right? And so you want to figure out um, how can we get more of the um, underbanked and, and also very much so unbanked people into the banking fold. And if as a country we make a policy decision that we want people to have banking services, right? Uh, you want people to be ba banked in some form. You don't want them to go to some seedy places to, you know, exchange exchange money in, in an alley, uh, done that in foreign countries, it was awful. Uh, the, the, but the truth of the matter is you, you want to benefit the end user, and the end user here is your ordinary consumer. This is, you know, the, the, your, your grandma in white tennis shoes who hopefully will start using technology, and your immigrant kid, and, and you know, a kid that grows up in inner city where there's not really an opportunity to walk to a branch, uh, you know, that, that's really safe. Um, and, and so you want to focus on those consumers and understand really how can we bring them into the banking system and into the fold because frankly, you know, and, and I, um, I'm afraid I'm going to become a one-trick pony if I keep on talking about my, uh, my secured credit card. When I first came to the United States, I, um, I, I availed myself of the opportunity to get a secured credit card, not because I thought it was great, because I couldn't get anything else. Uh, I had no income and no assets, basically I came here with $500. And I opened up a checking account. I knew I should have a checking account. You know, I came, I, came, I came from former Yugoslavia. I knew I should have a checking account. I should safeguard my $500 and I'm going to put them in a bank. And, uh, you know, there are immigrants who come from countries where you don't trust the banks. So you wouldn't put your $500 in a bank, right? You, you hide it someplace in the house. So I did. I opened up a checking account and then I realized everybody in the United States was using a credit card. Now, whatever you think about consumer debt, whether it's good or bad, this credit card was, to me, a symbol of kind of a fitting in. And so I applied for a credit card got flat out reject, re rejected, like big no. Uh, no income, no assets, uh, no job. I was a ninja before the term was even uh, popular in the financial industry. And, but they did make me an offer to open up a secured credit card. So I sent $300 of my $500 and I had to call my father back in the former Yugoslavia and tell him, um, um, you know, you remember the $500 you loaned to send me to America with some cash? Yes, yeah. so I took $300 and I sent it to the bank and the bank is going to hold my $300 and they're going to, I'm going to pay them interest on my $300 and they're going to hold it um, and I'm going to borrow against it, but it's a good thing, it's a great thing. And I think my, I mean, I think the phone calls back then, international phone calls were like $3.40 a minute. Uh, so I'm trying to say this very fast and I'm pretty sure that my father did not understand a word of what I was saying, not because he didn't understand the language, because the concept didn't make sense to him, okay? But that secured credit card, after 12 months, I, 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 they released my deposit, I got a, now I got an unsecured credit card and my credit limit was $500. So actually I benefited because my, my spending power was more. And when I went to grocery store, I no longer had to count pennies. You know, I, to this day I remember um, when I went to grocery store, because I did have to count pennies, uh, you know, eggs were 79 cents a dozen. Wonder Bread was expensive, but there was like a cheaper version that was 49 cents. And you could buy 12 of those frozen pies for 99 cents. And uh, yeah, all of the kids are now looking at me saying, okay, boomer. Uh, <laughs> things are a whole lot more expensive than then. Than, than, than. But, you know, you have to, when you don't have a credit, you don't have access to credit, you count pennies when you go to the grocery store because you do not want to be at the checkout and returning, you know, putting products out. So, so here's a stat that blows my mind, right? Uh, and this one isn't quite your agency because your agency's come up with a little bit of a different the number. The good things but, come from my agency, so all the bad um, things come from other it, agencies. Let's get this right. So this stat says $34 billion are spent in bank overdrafts, which occur when you go to the checkout counter because probably in your experience when they swipe the card, if you didn't have money, they said no, return some food. That, that was back then, yes. Right. It was, today, it was no, yes. today they say, sure, and then depending on whether or not you had the money, you get a fee. And that's a fee only paid by people who run out of money in their bank account. In addition, among people that, are, that use the overdraft, right? So more than half Americans never have one. Among bank people, it's, it's more than half. The average family spends over $1,000 a year in overdraft fees. Now think about how much money they have and think about how expensive that system is. So when you think we have free checking, right? It's really interesting what you pay for and what you don't. Uh, I was at a conference that you were at up in New York last month where somebody pointed out that 10 million people agreed to get Disney streaming at $7 a month. But the idea of $7 a month for a bank account, you know, that should be free. But then you think about who's paying for the bank account. Is it the people who are overdrafting, right, and the people who aren't? And this system 
you know, has both permitted that expansion and, you know, the question in this broker deposit rule, because it's the thing behind the thing on a lot of these debit or prepaid cards, because a lot of people now, instead of having that secured credit card, one in 10 swipes at the register is a prepaid card. How many people here have a prepaid card in their wallet, right? Starbucks gift cards count. One out of seven Americans will get one this month. It's one of the most popular holiday gifts in, in America. You need to pick your audience better. I think I only saw like six hands. Yeah, no, that's, that's exactly yeah, right. Yes. This is not a representative sample. And part of the problem among all policymakers and institutions is we have two classes of Americans that use the banking and payment system radically differently. And we have two classes of people that use broker deposits radically. The people who have sweep accounts at their broker dealers and have hundreds of thousands of dollars in cash or who use complex financial intermediation between multiple banks are using it one way. The people who are using debit and prepaid, prepaid cards are using it a different. All right, I'm getting the, the time here. No, no we're good. No, so, you get the last word. All right, no, I, 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 there was one question. I just want to make sure we, we... But if I don't like it, I'll do the last word and not answer your question, so... Very quickly. All right, never mind. He's a lawyer. I'm going to have the last word. No, I'm kidding. Go ahead. We are both grads of UC Berkeley Law, so is that helpful? Real, real quick. Um, yeah, I've represented uh, brokers and banks in this space since the late 80s. I was, I am a boomer. I was in the room when they adopted the legislation. You are absolutely correct on that point. It was on brokered CDs. That was the only show in town. There was no debate over what's a brokered deposit because nobody cared. It was brokered CDs, and that's what there was. So on that point, that's correct. I want to make a couple, uh, one minor historical point. One question. No points. Question. You can okay. send me a comment letter on the point. I have sent a comment. I, I will make. Okay. Aaron, since you made this comment, I'll probably have a question. Uh, you said brokered CD buyers are chasing rates. What's the current rate on a one year brokered CD? Oh, I, I, I have to look at the table. The, the, I, made the, I made the comment. The it's, tables are, are changing. I'm not, I'm not chasing rate. 1.65. Brokered CDs are currently trading within five to ten basis points of treasury securities. I can go to Goldman Sachs Bank and get a savings deposit at two and a half percent. So I think our paradigm, I will make a comment, the paradigm we're dealing with in terms of the average deposits through sweeps and CDs, much lower than you're representing here. These are sometimes smaller depositors. Secondly, the rates are not the rates, these quote high rate chasing rates that you're talking about. We've commented on this multiple times. We'll continue to comment, but thank you. Thank you. Great. Good things come of UC Berkeley. Um, so here's the bottom line. Um, I'm, uh, I never, when we do proposals on rules, I never profess that we know everything. We have a lot of institutional knowledge. We have a lot of data. We talk to a lot of people. But if we knew everything, and if we didn't have the requirements of the administrative procedure law uh, that basically requires us to go out with notice and, and comment, I would still want to hear from folks who are affected by our regulations. Uh, you know, part of my, my thing has been to go state by state. I've been to 28 states in my 18 months talking to people, banks, superintendents, customers. What are you getting? What are you not getting? You know, what are you hearing from the banks? Um, fintechs? I talk to fintechs. How are you teaming up with banks? You know, why did you do what you did? Um, and, and so I'm hoping that as we look to revise the framework and provide more certainty and frankly make it forward looking instead of retrospective back to, you know, looking at CDs and that's all we have to go by and now we're kind of meandering around that definition to fit every, everything else under that definition. That you will provide the feedback that we need to make our framework better. Uh, and I don't want you as, you, as you look at the proposal tomorrow, if it gets uh, approved, um, I, I don't want you to take a look at it uh, with any other view, but is this going to work? And can you help us think of the, of the shortcomings and, and help us think of the good things that can come out of it and then provide your comment letters. Make sure it's under seven, uh, 19 pages. The, uh, uh, and, and, and frankly, um, there is an opportunity here for us to make a system better. And I joke when I uh, said I think I switched my contact lenses this morning, but this is not a left or right issue. This issue is truly about is the system working at its maximum capacity? our regulatory system and our, is that capacity of the regulatory system allowing companies to innovate where we can get to that next stage of innovation in America and not in, in, in other jurisdictions uh, that we have to follow? Are we going to lead or are we going to fall behind? Thank you. Thank you. Join me in thanking the chair. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.